Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Scott Kid Potit. Scott is the mission pilot for the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission set to launch this summer from the historic launch complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Kid is a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who served 20 years in various roles to include, um, to include in the Air Force Thunderbirds, aggressors, weapon school, and operational test. He's a husband, father of three teenagers, and has an extensive background in endurance sports to include 15 Ironman triathlon. Scott, welcome to the future space. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you today. Can't wait to hear all the amazing work that you're doing right now with your team. But before we go there, could you share with us Three words that capture the essence of space for you. Three words that capture the essence of space. Uh, you know, I would start off with respect. Um, you know, respect is having deep admiration for someone or, or something. In this case, it's it's the vastness of space. Uh, you know, and, and just like pioneers experienced generations ago uh, when they set their sights on crossing oceans, exploring new continents, uh, uh, attempting new, never sum summited mountains, you know, um, you got to have that healthy respect uh, for those types of adventures and journeys and explorations. And, and space is, is certainly um, part of that. Um, and similar to your solo wilderness expeditions, uh, it takes extensive preparation, you know, and, and a full comprehension of, of the circumstances. Um, uh, in order to start having that respect uh, for those types of challenges that you'll soon face. and Because risk involved in, in a lot of things we do, and, and space is certainly one of those things. Uh, second word I'd say is education. Um, we have so much to learn uh, what's out there beyond the stars in our solar system. You know, the, the information and data we gather from satellites, from uh, telescopes like Hubble and Webb, um, great resources, and it's certainly opening our eyes to, to what's out there beyond the stars. Uh, but truly, it's a sliver, a, a glimpse of, of what there is to learn. Um, and we need to start this journey to, to learn as much as we possibly can. But introspectively, you know, education also involves understanding uh, our own emotional intelligence. Uh, you know, we got to manage our emotions and, and the stresses that we'll experience in these explorations. Um, in order to maintain those higher levels of situational awareness, which is something we always talk about in the fighter pilot community. Uh, because again, it gets back to that, um, that level of risk that we're willing to accept to, to explore these stars. Uh, because ultimately, you know, I think in, in my opinion, uh, humans are gonna be uh, the limitation as we uh, venture out here, um, you know, and with longer duration space flights. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say determination. Uh, we have to maintain the momentum that, that you're starting to see in the, in the space industry. Um, having the passion and, and inspiring the next generations, um, generation after generation, uh, in order to advance the technologies that we're starting to, uh, to see in order to explore. Um, you know, and something that, that we're used to, it's uh, what's going on in SpaceX. Uh, Elon and Gwen are, are doing a, um, a, a pretty cool job and uh, certainly doing their part in space exploration with all the launches. And we saw one last night with Crew-6 heading to the ISS tonight. So um, there's a lot to learn and a lot to experience. And it's, um, it's awesome just to be a part of that. When you say respect, the uh, I've always said that... Uh, Wilderness was for me my 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 connection and my my explorations my expeditions was always it's um exercise of humility finding yourself in places where forces are bigger than you even though you can you can ride them you can find a certain harmony within them you're always left with the impression that you're just a tiny speck on the back of a giant and and yes we keep pushing the boundaries but every time that we push one boundary, we realize there's a bigger boundary. So that respect, the humility is always part of the experience. And I think that's one of the gifts of exploration is that it 
brings us back to what living as a human being is in the same way that going to the moon looking was looking back on, on, on the, at, at earth and really having this, this this moment of realization of where we come from um i have a you said that the the, the second word was educate uh, education and obviously all the the knowledge but you brought this this element of the emotion education do you think that this it's actually something new that now we're realizing that we're not just machines to be fed information, but there's a component that is extremely important and it's the emotional benefit, the emotional education. Does that, do you think that that's something new in the, in our society? Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily something new. Um, it, it certainly, it touches upon one of the characteristics qualities that you just mentioned, humility. Um, that's w one quality I try to instill in my kids. I got three kids. Um, and, and humility is a, a lacking characteristic, uh, in our society. Uh, we're so enamored with social media and, um, uh, perspectives of others and how we're viewed. Um, and it's, I think it's a quality that, that we've lost and we need to instill and, in future generations because um, we need to understand our limitations. Uh, and that's part of emotional intelligence is uh, being able to manage those emotions, manage stress, maintain those higher levels of situational awareness on what's going on and how we interact with one, one another. Uh, you know, something else I always try to teach my kids is never burn a bridge. Um, some of the things I've accomplished in life, it's, it's, it can root all the way back to experiences years and decades ago um, that I was, you know, I potentially, or I fostered a relationship with someone and then on down the road that proved beneficial and, and opening a door for me uh, to have some of these experiences. Um, uh, but the human mind is, is certainly a, um, a challenging beast for sure. Um, and uh, as I alluded to, I, I think, you know, the more and more I get exposed to, to what's going on in the space industry and space exploration, um, and we talk about these long duration space flights, um, the human is going to be the limitation factor in all of this. Um, it's an austere environment and, and we need to understand how we're going to function. Um, so it's, um, it's certainly something that we need to explore more. It reminded me of uh, when I spend a lot of time doing my expeditions, part of my creative process or exploration process was always first to connect with the local people, being hosted and finding myself at the table, staying with them and sharing a meal. Because in my mind, it was always arrogant of me to think that I could visit these places that had never been and capture their spirit, their energy. And... What I wanted to do was more to hear their stories, connect with them, and through their eyes, through their stories, through their words, now get to learn what this place was about. And then they would tell me, oh, no, you got to go and see my friend or my uncle, and he's going to take you over there. But the biggest lesson that I discovered through all this process is that at that table, sharing a glass of wine and sharing a meal, we're all the same. We all thrive. We all strive for the same thing. We want to put food on the table. We want to send our kids to school. We want to have a certain value and purpose. Then after that, it gets complicated. But being exposed and taking the time to listen and to hear other people's story, we're all trying to navigate this world and accomplish the same thing. And there's, you know, you. <clears throat> rising above that one of the things one of the when we talk often about going to space and looking back and yes recognizing we all come from the same planet and there are no boundaries there are no borders i always feel like first we need to acknowledge that there are differences we're eight billion people on the planet and there's eight billion stories and there's a lot of geographical borders differences but we need to understand our differences so that we can rise above them because in the future when we're going to have people on the moon and on mars you're going to have these total different realities with different priorities and different goals 
And we're all going to need to come at the table and try to work things out. But if we say that, oh, no, we're all the same, it's like, no, that's going to be a little bit different. I think that it's part of the, the exercise of recognizing these different stories so that we can all come together. And working in the environment that you do, I think that's one of the components, right? Absolutely. And just to touch upon something you just said, listening. I, again, back to my kids, they got, uh, they got two ears and one mouth, and they need to listen twice as much as they talk. Um, and, and that's something that's just not taught, um, how to listen, how to hear, how to understand and comprehend what those stories are. Um, you know, some people ask us, why do we do some of these um, higher risk type activities, uh, climb mountains? We did Cotopaxi in preparation for our polar dawn, uh, the skydiving, um, uh, the scuba diving, the centrifuge, the altitude chamber. All those are opportunities to kind of um, understand how we all interact, communicate, and work together as a crew under stressful situations, you know, getting comfortable in uncomfortable scenarios. Um, and there's only so much we can do here on Earth. Up there in space, there's no reset button. You know, we can get in the simulator, we can go through scenarios, contingencies. If we screw up, it's like, okay, time out, guys. You know, I screwed up this. Let's reset it. Let's try that again. We can't do that up there. Um, and and we're going for five days, you know, in the ISS, they're, they're six months, uh, longest duration. We're talking just over a year. Uh, when we start venturing beyond the lunar surface, uh, heading towards Mars, we're talking eight, nine months to get there and the duration you're going to spend on the surface and then the return trip. That's a long time. Um, you got to be able to understand how the human is going to adapt and, and, accept some of those challenges uh, that they're going to face. And, and, and the first step, and, and it gets to your point that you just made, it's, it's understanding what those challenges are. Um, and I don't think we fully understand what they, those challenges are. Um, and that's why we've kind of um, focused our attention on the whole Polaris program as, as a developmental and operational type program to be able to identify some of those technological challenges as well as human challenges that we're all going to face with long duration space flight and see how we can overcome them or at least just simply understanding them. You know, one of our pr primary pillars, we have four for our mission. One of them is the science and research. We did a solicitation, uh, a request for proposals, and we selected 40 science and research experiments, and they all had to have um, elements of identifying some of those challenges that we're going to face because we want to continue to move the needle and progress forward. Um, so we have purpose in what we're doing in our simple five day mission. I think that's part of the beauty of our species is that we're able to create as we evolve and, you know, want to do things better and better. Like we're spending so much time now focusing on the human element knowing that we have the science and the technology, but it's not just about that. It's about how can we enrich our lives as we move forward. And I think that's a great segue on the, the second question that I want that I always start every interview with is what do you think is the human story of going to space? Oof. You know, we, we, we've, we've been at it for, what is it? Uh, 65 years or so NASA. Uh, starting off with the Mercury Project, Project Mercury, and then Gemini. Uh, and then, you know, a very short time after, we had the Apollo program onto the moon. Um, and then kind of that that second um, wave of uh, with the shuttle missions, and now we're on into uh, Falcon 9, eventually Starship, Starliner, and SLS. Um, it's it's thankfully it's continues to evolve um as technology continues to improve and get better with with the latest innovations um it's exciting to watch uh, it's exciting to be a part of in our very small little uh sliver of this experience in space exploration um you know my my adventure started only a couple of years ago with with space um i thought my ceiling was was flying fighter jets um, but I've been blessed with this opportunity to go to space and, um, 
uh, over the last couple of years working with SpaceX alongside in collaboration uh, with initially the, the Inspiration4 mission and now Polaris program. Um, it's absolutely amazing what humans are able to develop. Um, and we're a witness to that every time we go to um, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne to train. You know, uh, there are 11,000 employees there, McGregor, Starbase, um, working 24-7 uh, to advance our quest for space exploration. And nothing is more impressive, again, what we're involved with with Falcon 9. Uh, uh, but when you go down to Starbase, I don't know if you've ever been down there, but um, we've had the privilege to go down a couple times. And each time we go, it's a new iteration of development and, and not only in, in the infrastructure, uh, but in the production line, the high bays, the mega bays, the, the number of vehicles and boosters they generate, you know, we were standing underneath the nose cone um, and the volume in that nose cone is equivalent to ISS. And Elon's vision is to launch three of these a day, every day. And you just, we were in the, the production bay and, and there's just nose cone after nose cone in production. And all of those are eventually going to fly and go to space. And it's just, it's just mesmerizing and it's, it's exciting to watch. Um, uh, so we got a lot to look forward to in the coming chapters. Do you, I, I believe that the, the hardship of life has a specific purpose of actually bringing us back to what matters and gives us the incentive to go outside of our comfort zone and come together or, or a teamwork. You've, you've been trained and you've spent the life in pushing the boundaries and learning how to cope with the stress so that you, you can accomplish better. Um, Last year, we we're talking at the beginning of the war, you and Jared went and delivered help and food. Um, and now you're training to get the Polaris. Do you think that it's the, these hardships are a, a necessity for make us a, first of all, more humble, but also for giving us the incentive to become more um, social rather than uh, separated because we we become too comfortable. Absolutely, I you know I think it's essential for growth. I think we get too comfortable sometimes, um, not taking risks, um, and and maybe it was the uh, the level of experience I had flying fighter jets for twenty years. It just it becomes second nature. Um, but when you do find yourself in some of these scenarios that are riskier than others, um, those are the times where introspectively you got to look at yourself and, and, and prioritize and figure out how to solve certain challenges. We all face challenges. Um, some are, are um, uh, certainly uh, setbacks and obstacles, uh, we all, fe uh, you know, we all face in life, whether they're financial health related, um, life, uh, uh, family, um, you can address those and tackle them different ways. Uh, you can succumb and give up and raise your hands and, and, um, let someone else figure them out. Or, you know, you, you, plow through the proverbial wall of misfortune um, and tackle these challenges head on. Um, you certainly learn a lot about yourself and, and there is a lot of growth that is to follow when you do uh, have these experiences. Um, you know, how a lot of people ask me, how, how do you manage certain situations, whether they're contingencies, emergency procedures, or um, those higher risk scenarios. And it's, I think a lot of it is is um, roots back to my experiences flying fighter jets and how I handled some of those scenarios in in combat. Um, and it's it, it's those basic skill sets that um, 
have uh, I've benefited from to get me uh, kind of to where I'm at. Um, and I'm very fortunate as well uh, just to have these opportunities. So I think the part, part of that process is recognizing, like you were saying earlier, our limitations, our vulnerabilities so that you can prepare yourself and compensate and be ready. And I think that in our, in our society right now, I think we're drinking too high on thinking that we're so good at one thing. And then when, when we do find ourselves in these situations, we don't have the tools or the skills we've f forgotten to give ourselves the tools for communications and understanding, you know, how different people are as opposed to just kind of protect <clears throat> like shelving, um, shelving ourselves away from the uncomfortableness of what it is to be human. And instead of, of showing up prepared, we're showing up lacking all the, the tools that are, that are necessary to be actually good humans. Right. Mm -hmm. That's certainly something I've recognized in our training uh, for Polaris Dawn. Um, it is certainly a team effort, um, reliance upon the crew. You know, Jared's an experienced astronaut with Inspiration4. He, he knows the system. Besides being an, an extremely intelligent individual, he knows the systems uh, that, uh, that's uh, in and out of, of the Dragon capsule. Uh, and then you have Anna and Sarah, uh, experienced SpaceX engineers. Uh, Anna is, is, writes checklist procedures for contingency operations for the Dragon capsule. And then Sarah has taught every single NASA astronaut um, who has flown on the Dragon capsule. Um, so I think what this experience has taught me is the reliance upon working together as a team. Um, first, coming to the table, understanding what strengths and weaknesses, more importantly, what weaknesses you have uh, and what you're bringing um, to the fight. Um, and then it, it's about forming that crew through these experiences, through our training, uh, to understand what roles we each play um, in order to achieve our ultimate goal is, is a successful, safe mission. Um, so reliance upon each other, and that gets back to the humility and understanding your limitations, uh, because uh, to think that we can do it alone is, is foolish. Um, it, it's certainly a team effort, and it's not only our crew of four. Um, we have behind the scenes a, a Polaris team of seven, eight individuals who are day in and day out working on the bigger picture stuff, um, uh, philanthropy, um, uh, the training schedule, the the communications and the media plan coming up for the launch itself. Uh, and then obviously you got uh, what I talked about before is, is the SpaceX family. Um, what those engineers are able to accomplish and, you know, take our suit as a simple example. Um, they've flown with the IDA suit uh, for several years now. Um, and then in a very short period, it's been, just about a year, they took the IVA suit as a baseline and developed their prototype EVA suit that we're going to use on our mission. Um, and to think they did it in less than a year on a fraction of the budget that, um, you know, historically you look at some of the other suits flown for EVAs, it's, it's billion dollar programs um, and decades to develop. Um, and I have full faith and confidence in, in the technology they're developing. We, we, put them on every time we go out there for training. Uh, we're testing, 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 and they don't sleep. Um, they are relentless in their pursuit of, of, uh, um, of a successful mission. And that starts with uh, the safety of this technology that they're developing. Amazing. Before we get into more into the mission, you, you said um, a couple of moments ago that space was new to you. So you, you were not a pilot who wanted to be an astronaut. You were a pilot and you thought that, you know, you had to reach as high and space came and found you, correct? It, it did. Um, so very non-traditional. You, you would think flying fighter jets, it's pretty traditional when you look back in the history of space flight, space exploration with Mercury and Gemini and, and Apollo, all the test pilots. Uh, you know, my my flying experience was um, was certainly part of 
of the recipe of where I'm at. Um, but the non-traditional piece is, is I, I was a struggler uh, academically growing up. You know, I was a C and D type student focused on sports more than anything. Um, you know, I only got into college based on my running resume, be able to, uh, to run cross country and track. Thankfully that happened. Um, and I was, I was blessed to, to have this experience to, um, I got exposed to what's called outdoor education at the university of New Hampshire. So it's, it's a, it's a degree that's, that's, um, focused on experiential learning. Um, so the outdoor piece, I took classes like scuba diving, rock climbing, winter mountaineering, whitewater rafting, Nordic skiing. Um, but it was all based on learning a skill set through experiential learning. Um, and it just clicked with me, you know, lectures, the traditional way, hours and hours of retention of information, data, uh, sometimes useless. It just didn't work for me. Um, I didn't have the motivation nor desire nor the de- determination. Um, uh, but I did with the outdoor education. Um, so that kind of got me through, got my degree. I was part of the ROTC program. So that's kind of the door that led to flying fighters. Um, I had one opportunity in the ROC, ROTC to go in the, um, an incentive flight in the backseat of a tanker. And I watched some F-16s get refueled, got deathly airsick, but it was enough of a spark to see those F-16s get refueled that I'm like, I want to do that. Um, so I set my goal. Um, uh, I got over the air sickness. I got over my fear of heights. Uh, I got over the challenges of, of academics. Um, and I got uh, my pilot um, slot um, with the Air Force when I kicked that off. And then I started flying and spent 20 years doing that. Um, I thought that was kind of the, the the apex of my aviation aerospace career. I always had a passion for space. I thought it was um, amazing. You know, the, I grew up in in the Right Stuff era uh, when the movie came out in the eighties. Uh, by far, my favorite movie. Um, but I never thought it was possible. You know, it was the test pilots. It was the ones with um, uh, physics and aerospace engineering degrees, PhDs. Um, I never thought it possible until, you know, I, I, while I was on the Thunderbirds, I met Jared Isaacman, um, who was an avid um, uh, pilot as well, started a demo team in the civilian sector. um, And that friendship um, developed over time. I worked for him for several years before he um, uh, started this whole space venture with Inspiration4. You know, Inspiration4 came at a time where there was a lot of negative press about billionaires and going out for themselves. And within one month, it was William Shatner and then Inspiration4 that really brought it down to why we were doing this. I think Jared did an absolute amazing job at capturing what it can be, you know, the philanthropy side aspects, these different characters, you know, with Cyan and and Chris and um, Haley, but really doing an amazing job. And you were right at the center. You were a mission director, correct? I was. And, you know, that that was certainly the, the catalyst for, for what we're doing now. Um, he could have easily selected three of his buddies to go along with him uh, and gone on this venture, one and done. That was a great experience and had some fun. Um, but from the very, very beginning, uh, he wanted to make it uh, bigger than himself, uh, and he wanted to knock down uh, those doors and expand space exploration for for all. Um, so from the very beginning, it was uh, it was all about a partnership because his quest was not only to explore space but to make life better here back on Earth. Uh, and what better um, partner than to select St. Jude to go along with us? Um, and that was big, a big part of my role is just to work with the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, figure out um, every single possible way we could uh, raise awareness and raise funds for their causes. Because Jared's, you know, philanthropic um, efforts go further back than, than just uh, St. Jude. You know, he did a lot of uh, support for uh, Make-A-Wish. 
um, during his days in the air show uh, industry. Um, and it's even further back when he uh, did his world record um, uh, attempts with uh, business jets around the world. Um, uh, but he thought, you know, let's address the problem at the root. Um, instead of granting wishes, let's work to find a cure so we don't have to grant as many wishes. Um, and I, I won't lie, it, it was a challenging year for sure. It was tough on the families. I, I've never worked harder in my life traveling because we were just trying to figure it out. You know, what were we going to do? We wanted to make it um, do some type of random selection. That's where we did the whole uh, partner with St. Jude and gave one seat to them. Um, so that selection was up to St. Jude. We did the sweepstakes and then we did the entrepreneur um, contest. Uh, and and those that vision uh, stayed at the forefront through that entire journey. Um, so most of my effort was focused on St. Jude and then um, helping the crew get uh, to and from the training. Um, and then in a very short, you know, I think the the announcement was in a February, and then the the mission launched in September, and they had to get food, fitted for suits and and do some training before that. Um, so we couldn't imagine, um, couldn't write a better story uh, for that experience, um, and and based on what we were able to accomplish with Inspiration Four, was was the spark that led us down the the Polaris. Uh, program uh, conversation and eventual uh, partnership with Saint or with uh, SpaceX. So you were involved really at the center of it, but more on the logistics side. And now you're at really at the center of it, part of the team. What? So what is Polaris? What? What is the timeline? What is what you're looking to achieve um, and get out of of, of this mission? So the, the Polaris program is uh, up to three space flights. Um, the idea behind the vision was to make it more operational, uh, to, to identify some of the developmental technology challenges that we're going to face as we venture further and out uh, and, and longer duration space flights. Similar to what, you know, there's there's so many accomplishments with, with NASA and we you know, Jared says it quite often, it, we're truly standing on the shoulders of giants based on those accomplishments. And we would never be where we're at without um, those achievements. Uh, and one of those achievements is the Gemini program. Um, it more or less bridged the gap between initial space flight with the Project Mercury and then going to the moon uh, with the Apollo program. And they, in the mid sixties, they identified some of those challenges and and obstacles to get to the moon. So they were able to accomplish the first docking, the first spacewalk, multi crew, longer durations, um, and and we kind of wanted to mimic that in a very small way um, as SpaceX makes the transition from the F nine to Starship. So the idea behind our three missions. Uh, the first two will be on Falcon 9, Dragon Capsule. And then the third mission, Jared will command the first crewed Starship mission um, a couple years down the road when they're ready for that. Uh, but as far as Polaris Dawn, the first mission, Jared's commander, I'm the pilot, and then Sarah and Anna make up the uh, mission specialist. And then Anna's also the, the medical officer. Um, we have four primary pillars. Uh, for our mission. Um, the first is complete the first commercial spacewalk. So we'll do an EVA um, uh, during this mission. We also um, are looking to push the envelope on the altitude. Um, so we're striving for uh, right around 1,400 kilometers, Gemini 11 back in 1966, set the record for Earth orbit. Apollo, obviously a completely different story, but Gemini 11 went to 1,368 kilometers. Uh, so we want to venture out there and continue to um, uh, gather as much information as we possibly can. So uh, as most people know, that's the lower portions of the Van Allen belt, um, slightly higher radiation levels. So uh, some of our exper experiments of science and research are focused on um, testing and understanding uh, those exposures to the radiation. 
Um, and then the third objective is to accomplish uh, the first um, testing of Starlink from space. So again, communication is going to be one of the big challenges um, and more reliance upon crew and not necessarily automated systems um, with those delays in connectivity, uh, the latency that, that we experience now. Hopefully we can improve upon that. But still, when you talk about venturing to Mars, it's those durations are going to have, uh, you know, a direct impact on one's ability to to execute. And then lastly, we have the four, 40 science and research experiments that we have lined up. And again, those are to identify some challenges. We're doing um, uh, certain experiments that address um, uh, space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, the, the increase in pressure. In, uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid and that how that can have a direct impact on your vision, your cognitive functioning. We don't know much about it. Um, uh, and we certainly need to learn a lot more before we start heading, heading out. Um, radiation is another um, area that we're interested in. Um, we're doing a lot of ultrasound scans. Um, uh, some of these elements are, you know, how are we going to address um, Healthcare concerns on these longer durations, uh, so that's why we're going to we're going to do some of these ultrasounds. Um, uh, we're testing up a um, glucose monitor uh, from space. Um, there's a whole list of of experiments, um, uh, but that's been a, bu a fun part working with these universities, these institutions, hospitals, organizations, um, because they're certainly passionate about what they're doing. Um, and some of these experiments to be able to have those limited opportunities to be exposed to whether it's a vacuum or it's a microgravity that can be very expensive. You know, the concept behind our mission is it's completely free. Uh, we just need to have experiments that benefit and move the needle as we progress. Uh, so those are the four primary objectives. Um, uh, right now, we're we're scheduled to launch this summer, uh, and we're getting down to a couple months of uh, uh, training, and everything's looking good. Exciting, exciting, exciting! I was um, so last year. I spent some time up in the Arctic and Antarctica, and every time, I can't stop but really reminding myself of the hardship of exploration back in the days you know without instruments if you wanted to know something you had to go over there and figure it out by yourself and in the process it was a lot of the human cost was super high and you know just crossing the atlantic on a cell ship scurvy malaria i mean i mean thousands and millions of people died in the process of, of the quest of knowledge reading stories of the uh, of uh, uh, English uh, expedition down in Antarctica, spending the winter just to go and get the weather and almost dying of carbon monoxide on so many times. And now today we have a drone on Mars. We have rovers on Mars. I, we have a capacity now to explore minus the, the severity of the human cost. And, you know, you're, you're, explaining to me everything that you are preparing yourself and the, the knowledge, the, the awareness of how much we need to learn and test before we go so that we don't go through these, I mean, we, we don't go through these tragedies. There will be new tragedies, but at the same time, I think that the, the, the extreme of the human cost in the exploration Will not will never be what we've experienced. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You, small tangent. Did you? Uh, what would you do down in Antarctica? Oh, <laughs> so it couldn't be more different than the, old, the I mean, the early explorers. I was on Seaborn Seaborn Venture, which is a new luxurious expedition ship, and you know, even just five or ten years ago, these kind of experiences were only reserved for the hardcore, you know, from the ones who would just want to write it, you know, like dry. But now you have, so Venture, this new ship, expedition ship, first of all, 
has uh, the, 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 the software, the AI, the stabilizers. It has, it's no more the, the propeller shaft, the, the, the shaft that turns the propellers. It's all these giant um, um, acipods that they call. So it's a, it's a the giant propellers that can face, first of all, it faces forward. So it's pulling the ship, no more pushing the ship. So much more efficient. And these are con continuously doing micro adjustment to keep the ship, you know, as possible, as uh, stable as possible so that you cruise the Drake passage and you got, you know, a 20 feet, 30 feet swell and you're still riding and you're in a restaurant drinking a glass of champagne and you're like, <laughs> this, this, this is insane. But the humility of being reminded of how far we've come so that we can expand and extend those experiences to people who not necessarily would want to really rough it up and just like have, you know, just for the sake of it, that someone who is either 50 years old or 75, or even we had some like 98 years old who came down and got to see, I mean, taken, it's not cheap, but more and more gradually that's, the curve of, of accessibility and, uh, you know, a space is going to follow the same thing. Absolutely. So, so we actually went down to Antarctica, um, 2020. So a couple of years back, um, we spent new year's Eve up on top of Mount Benson or Benson massive climbing the peak down there. Um, but in a similar fashion, you know, you're taking a jet down there and, um, you do have, basic infrastructure to be able to survive and sustain with with heat and it's certainly nowhere in the same ballpark as what those um pioneers did uh you know only decades ago um to be able to explore our planet let alone what's out there um but i think that's what we're doing right right now with the space industry and companies like um, SpaceX and Blue Origin, it's it's incremental risk, um, very calculated. Um, just seeing how SpaceX functions, engineers come up and develop these technologies and these these paths forward, the mission profile that we're going to execute. Uh, we can't afford um, to have a significant setback. Um, it's just the the new era that we live in um, relative to what those pioneers experienced back in the day where they were willing to risk it all. Uh, we can't afford to do that. It's got to be very calculated um, and incremental. And, and that's, I, I think we're doing it right. Um, example is just the development of, of the suit. Um, uh, and that's the reason why we've had some of these delays is just um, working through some of the challenges. Uh, and every time they come up with a so solution to a challenge, um, it's very reassuring and, and safety continues to be a top priority. Um, and it has to be because um, uh, the public can't handle um, a, a, a catastrophe or a significant setback. It would delay um, our advancement for years to come. Um, so I, I think we're doing it right. Um, and as long as we keep that in the forefront, um, uh, we'll continue the progression the way it has been going. I'm sure you are. You are. Um, it was, um, it was so th there was something that was running in the back of my mind because we just came back from the Caribbeans and totally out of nowhere, I was on the ferry and I looked up, it was dark, the sun had come down and I look up and I see this, uh, this, plume like almost northern light but i was not i was not expecting it so i didn't know what it was until i realized that it was the spacex launch all the way down to saint martin and i found myself totally straight back to gattaca <laughs> when this the when he's looking up and just this is his connection to dream and and understanding is like this is where we're going and now more and more into this world, we're gonna have people around the world experiencing this connection to these places where we're going. And if there's one thing that I've come talking to, you know, all these pioneers and experts and even myself, you know, what I've done in my life, the, 
our sense of limitation today is not an indicator of what can and can't be done because we're constantly pushing, re, you know, recreating our reality. And if the past is one big lesson is that whatever we thought we couldn't do today is taken for granted. You know, you know, now, now we look at our limitations, like, no, this is going to be impossible in mm -hmm. 50 years, a hundred years from now, we're going to look back at our time is going to be, well, you know, they were like limited in what they thought was possible. And every day you're talking about the people at SpaceX that are working continuously trying to fix these issues. This is one of the reasons why I'm not a doom and gloom about where we are today as a species. I see so many people who wake up in the morning obsessed at trying to find solutions so that we can move forward and be a, bit, a better civilization, a better society, and going and, and continuing expanding those boundaries. I cannot but be hopeful, not naive. I think there's a big difference between you know being, being naive and understanding our capacity to fix and to rise in the worst of times. But that's for me, that's the beauty of the human species. Scott, we started with your three words that capture the essence of space. But I do want to get three words with all your experience. What would be your three words of wisdom? Whew. Three words of wisdom. I, I would say the first one, I'll, I'll piggyback on um, our first space flight uh, with inspiration for. I, I think inspiration um, is critical for progress. Um, we all have passions, um, and and thankfully the the engineers at SpaceX, that passion, that inspiration is is advancement in space exploration, um, and and I think that's what having that inspiration is what helps us take on the daily challenges, which ultimately lead to longer, um, accompl or bigger accomplishments over time. Um, and that advancement that, that you're referring to, um, you know, just looking at Starship, I would have never dreamed humans could create a vehicle that's going to hold 100, 150 passengers, um, and it's going to launch three times a day. Um, and that, that dream, that vision is, is not too far away. Um, and it is certainly a possibility and a reality. Um, if you had asked any of us 10, 20, 30 years ago, it's probably only one human on earth, Elon, that would have said, yes, it's going to be a reality. <laughs> um, but thankfully, people, people like the engineers at uh, SpaceX have that vision, have that passion, have that inspiration. Vision, I think, would be another one. Um, um, you know, it, it took the vision of all those pioneers that we've, we've discussed over the last hour uh, to be able to venture uh, beyond their comfort zones and take those risks. Um, risks that we certainly view as, 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 as potentially too risky. Um, uh, but thankfully, they had the vision and that passion uh, to be able to explore um, and, and give it a shot. Um, so we can venture out um, on this planet itself. Um, and then third, commitment. That's a good one. Um, we need to stay committed uh, to um, the visions that we have um, in order to, to achieve the goals that we they want to pursue. Uh, we have to have that level of commitment and, and people willing to take those those risks um to be able to uh, continue this journey of space exploration the uh even just i would say five years ago if someone had uh asked me if i want to live until 150 years old i'd be like nah you know i think i think that i think that 100 on this planet is is uh, long enough and now someone offered me would i live until for 400 years i would be like Yes, even if I'm even even if I'm I'm gonna be like stuck in the bed, it's <laughs> I just I just feel that like we're opening the door to an entire new 
era of redefining what is the human experience. And the next 50, 100 years, 150 years, are going to totally revolutionize our understanding of life. And, you know, I've compared it often when, you know, life on Earth went from single cell to multi cell. It led to the Cambrian evolution, an explosion in evolution. And now we're about to go from a single planet to multi planet. And that leap again is going to totally create a, a, a giant leap in evolution. So can't wait. Can't wait to see. And you're at the front, you're at the, the, the forefront of it. And I, we, I can't wait to, to see to see you wave goodbye as you go up in, into space. Up. Right. And, and that's what we want to do is bring along the public. That's that's why we're doing the first Starlink test from space. Hopefully I can FaceTime people. Um, connectivity is, is certainly not there yet, um, but hopefully we can break down one of those barriers to continue this um, advancement. Well, I'll be right there and I'll be waving and waiting for you, <laughs> your FaceTime. <laughs> your FaceTime. <laughs> awesome. Scott, thank you so very much. Thank you very much as well.